Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Agon Homza, and I am here with my uh, friend, uh, colleague, and collaborator, Frank Ruda, uh, my co host of the Christ and Critique uh, podcast, Philosophy and its Other Sea. Uh, today, it is my great uh, pleasure to introduce our next guest uh, on the podcast. We are proud to welcome Alenka Zupancic. Uh, Zupancic is a research uh, advisor and professor at the Institute of uh, Philosophy at the Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts. Uh, she graduated from uh, the University of Ljubljana in 1990. She received her first PhD in 1996, if I'm not mistaken, Alenka. Uh, in the fact I'm not of... sure anymore, but probably yeah, this was a long time ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, in the university, in the, in the faculty of uh, arts, in the University of Ljubljana, under the supervision of uh, Slava Zizek, and just a year later, uh, under Alain Badiou's supervision, she defended her second PhD in the University of Paris. Uh, with her PhD thesis with Badiou was later published as Ethics of the Real Kant and Lacan in. 2020 uh, with uh, in uh, 2022, right? With uh, Verso. Uh, I think it was uh, even earlier, 2000. No, 20. Oh. Uh, yeah, it anyway, was. Then the, there is a around, reprint. But, there is a later reprint, yeah. but uh, okay. yeah, this was a long uh, again long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, okay. So. Uh, Alenka is a member of the Ljubljana School of uh, Psychoanalysis, and together with Slava Zizek and Mladen Dalar, they formed the group that we all know and refer to as the Troika. Uh, I'm not going to mention all her many books and publications, uh, which have been translated into numerous languages. However, I will just mention her latest publication, which is uh, Let Them Rot, Antigone's uh, Parallax. This is uh, the thing. Uh, which was uh, published just uh, a few weeks ago with Fortum uh, University Press. And I think we will discuss this book a little bit in what uh, follows. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about Alenka's uh, philosophical and psychoanalytical uh, uh, projects. Uh, I think that's what we're going to do in this uh, episode. But I think it's very important to know that Alenka's project has not only expanded the realms uh, in which she works, namely philosophy and psychoanalysis, but she has also expanded our understanding of them. And she has done so especially by proposing a very specific form of articulation between uh, philosophy and uh, psychoanalysis. Okay, now I shut up and I hand uh, this over to Frank to start off our conversation. Alenka, thank you so very much for being with us here today. Let me say thank you as well. I'm really, really, Honored and pleased to be here and to have the discussion with you. Um, okay, I, I'm 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 uh, uh, um, also starting with a lot of um, gratitude and thanks um, um, to Alenka for being here with us, and um, and Agon already mentioned the new Antigone book, um, Antigone's Parallax, Let Them Rod. Um, this just came out, um, and our question, our first question is basically. Why a new book on Antigone? Um, this seems to be something that, strangely, I don't know, persists um, and 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 keeps insisting, maybe even in this tragic figure and the whole setup of Antigone. So, I mean, to rephrase that again, why after Hegel, Hölderlin, Lacan, Zizek, Butler, Kopchak, Lakuda, Barge, Steiner, and so many others, another another take on this persistent figure? I think I could perhaps um, start answering this question by pointing out that not only there are these many, many different and extremely powerful readings that keep occurring, but there are also many different versions, rewritings of the text itself. I mean, okay, Zizek's example is uh, this already in the bunch of the thinkers that you mentioned. So new plays, new novels, new poems even. So, and I think this is quite unique or at least uh, rather rare. This, this kind of urge or, or desire to create a new work of art around the signifier or the work of uh, the, 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 the figure of Antigone. So, uh, and I suppose it is precisely the existence of this desire of this urge that could be to, this urge to recreate or create uh, something here again 
uh, that perhaps is the best would be the best answer to to, to your question. Why uh, did I write this book? Uh, because this is what intrigued me most. What, what is <laughs> going on there? And uh, I think perhaps we could use this kind of um, very complex Lacanian term, but I think it fi uh, fits this occasion uh, as if there were something in um, Antigone in this play, which doesn't stop not being written. You know, this is this uh, very interesting way with which Lacan combines the, uh, the necessary with the impossible. So that there is this kind of uh, interesting thing that I think is happening here. So uh, it's not simply that people, including artists, have uh, all their own take uh, on Antigone, uh, this, I guess, it's quite useful for, for all big works of art. But I think there is something more unusual, more fundamental uh, uh, in uh, at stake in this play. And I, of course, in the book, I pursue this something more fundamental on many different layers. And this is not the, the, the opportunity to, to resume all this, but just to make a kind of a general answer to, to 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 this i think we could say that perhaps um, what makes uh, what makes the play antigone eternal as we say it's not uh, that the text addresses uh, some eternal questions eternal values eternal problems that keep recurring uh, i think actually that antigone has much less to do with the themes that constitute its content uh, than we like to believe. I believe that there is something about the place almost, whatever, we could even call it mathematical structure and the way in which this structure manages to, to kind of articulate its own impasse, its own access, its own point of limit that is so powerful. So, uh, of course, to concentrate on the themes that I focus on on the book, which are uh, violence, burial rights, and incest, these themes all have, I think, this uh, specificity of leading straight to some hiccup of the structure, so to say. In all, all they have this in supercharge uh, to some kind of mm, short circuit that both illuminates and obfuscates the workings of the given structure. So, and this is important, not only illuminates, but also obfuscates. So it's very interesting. I, I think this is why these themes all need, are fascinating, but they also all need to be kind of unpacked. And this is what I basically uh, tried to do in, uh, in the book. Well, to continue, uh, we were wondering, from your perspective, what makes uh, Antigone a contemporary, if if she if she is one? Uh, what does her strange choice uh, speak to, and rather, what does it address? Yeah, I don't know. Perhaps um, one would need to take a certain, some some time to answer this question because it's not so so simple. I go against this both reading where Antigone is just this kind of figure of liberation, like straight freedom fighter, and uh, also the plays that try to completely uh, readings that try to completely relativize the the kind of position that she has vis-a-vis uh, -vis Creon. So um, I think we should perhaps consider this on. Uh, several levels, at least two perhaps. One is that uh, in her challenging Creon's decree, um, of course, it, I think it's completely wrong to, to simply define this in terms of like public stay or state or public law uh, versus some other law of gods or traditions or family and so on. I think this is really a wrong reading and I think Antigone is not cannot be said as a figure of defender of family values and whatever this would imply. So on the other hand, Creon is also does not simply embody public law in general. I mean, he, is a, he embodies a very particular 
law in a very particular state or city, as it was called then. So, which is a very different kind of city than Athens, for example. Uh, so, and this is an important theme all throughout the, the Theban theology. I mean, also the two Oedipus places. So Creon's rule is described in this place and in some others as being tyrannic or being kind of authoritarian versus the, let's say, more democratic. So there is this kind of, a, um, it's perhaps too simplistic to just say, okay, he's the, the ruler, so this is the public uh, uh, state law. It's a very specific public state law. Moreover, his decision to, 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 to refuse Polynesia's burial is itself, I think, a kind of subjective access over the, the, the public law or the, the rule of law, which is not directly justified in this. If you read the, the context, this is not something that would be just expected of him. It is a decision, it is, and I, I read it in the sense that he uses this kind of public law to justify and enforce his rather whimsy, let's say, decision. So, and the community, the, the state, are they are already suffering because of this decision. This is clear, you know, there's this dialogue between Creon and Theresias who comes begging him to, to step down and to not insist because uh, there are all these signs of sickness in the state of tips, which is which he attributes explicitly to Creon's stubborn insistence, and Creon again doesn't want to uh, to to yield an inch. Uh, so uh, it is not simply that he is representing some kind of general public good, but a very particular thing. So now Antigone, of course, also doesn't act in the name of public good or general welfare and so on. This is a, it's quite clear. Uh, and of course, you could say that she only sees herself or Polynes, uh, his body, uh, and she would also rather die than uh, yield in her claim. So there is some justification in this perspective in which actually the, the city of Thebes is kind of held host hostage of the two <laughs> stubborn wills. But uh, nevertheless, I really think, and this would be the important point, that there is no symmetry between the two figures, that they are not simply symmetrical, Creon and Antigone. Um, and that there is even a kind of consequential symmetry uh, at work in how, uh, how they are configured in the play, let's say. Uh, and this is not simply because Creon uh, has power and so all the state apparatus at his disposal, this is not what I mean by a symmetry, but more on this kind of, fundamental level, if, if I put it very simply, Antigone does not only stand up with her highly subjectivized claim, subjectivized in the sense that he clearly says, yeah, I would not do this even not for my husband or my uh, kids, just for Pauline. I mean, there is something excessively subjective in the way she argues, explains the law that she's following, but not only she's kind of, um, um, stands up with this subjective claim, she does this at the same time at some very, very precise, let's say, pathological point of the general structure that of which she becomes a subjective figure. So I think she is here really literally uh, a split and is in, becomes the embodiment of this structural point as well. So in this precise sense, she is more than herself. Um, and whereas I don't think we can say this for Creon, even though he's kind of embodying the state and whatever, but he's just himself. He's not, uh, he doesn't have, uh, he doesn't stand or touch this particular point in the structure, which could be said that, that is the one which reveals some truth about this structure. And I think if I can go on for this a little bit more, then there is an interesting parallel, parallel that could be uh, drawn here between, uh, and I'm not the first to point it out, but uh, between what Freud was saying about the hysterics and hysterical position and what one can say about Antigone, namely that uh, you can say many things about hysterics, how they are part of the game, how they just uh, well, they have some highly subjectivized uh, claim, but at the same time, they all, as a rule, also embody a certain kind of a blind spot 
of the family structure, of the social structure, whatever. So there is a truth that goes beyond uh, simply uh, what they say, but that there is something that comes across through these figures, which is more than just uh, um, is it uh, justified or not. So it's not, uh, I don't want to claim that uh, Antigone is hysterical. I'm just saying that it is a way in which this, that asymmetry can be seen as uh, in the way in which she is also embodying a certain um, uh, point in the structure which is irreducible and which kind of has the power of making us see uh, something more than just what comes out or across from her confrontation with uh, with Creon. So, and obviously she's not simply a good guy, what we say, good girl, whatever. This is very interesting. Uh, she's not some exemplary subjectivity that we would look up to. Um, and yet, and I think this and yet, uh, accounts for us returning to this figure. It, this is precisely what is interesting. It's that it's not simply about illustrative actor subjective heroes in this sense, but that there is something, um, yeah, also fundamental and interesting with when it comes to, to whatever, um, social rebellion or whatever. Um. Thanks. I, I can immediately connect to this. I think. I mean, is there? <clears throat> do you think, um, like Antigone embodying this blind spot of structure, and and this being that something that doesn't stop being written, her persistence, does that say? Is that a entry point uh, into our present conjuncture? Does that? I mean, does does that indicate something that this still speaks to us? Does that say something about our present conjuncture? I mean, there is the idea that there. That Antigone still speaks to us because there is a persistence of the tragic structure per se, right? Modernity is tragic, for example, in in its overall overall comportment and constitution and so forth. But you seem to be saying something slightly different. Um, but are you? I mean, that's yeah. Yeah, I know. Perhaps the two can be related, but at the same time, uh, I, I'm not so sure about the tragic. Oh, okay, there is also this line that uh, actually modernity has lost the tragic grandeur that some argue the, the opposite, that precisely nothing uh, is really tragic anymore in, or cannot be in this, uh, let's say, at least classical sense. But in a way, I think it's interesting. Uh, if you think about Antigone's uh, tragedy, it is already, in, according to the Greek standards, perhaps, okay, I'm not a specialist here, but it, it's already a, perhaps a kind of untypical tragedy. As is Medea for this, uh, for, for the matter, like, and perhaps, I, I know this is perhaps going too fast, but it seems sometimes that tragedy is fe uh, featuring main heroines rather than heroes uh, tend to be kind of situated at the, already at some kind of edge of the tragic. It's a slightly different structure, per, perhaps because women were not allowed to be kings in the sense. So the, this classical formula of tragedy that, that you have to fall from the highest possible point, which meant more or less the, the, the king, whatever the ruler. Uh, it, it, the structure here is different. And I think one of the things that kind of comes to mind and speaks to our present, whatever um, struggles and stuff, is that uh, what these figures perhaps have in common, Antigone, Medea, and to some extent Hamlet perhaps, is that they kind of act in response to something that they deem absolutely wrong. There is this kind of insurrection thing, which is not typical of tragedies in general. There is this declaration of a, terrible wrong that is that they then try to whatever they artic articulate in different ways this kind of insurrection which is an insurrection against a higher power they are not in the higher position possible there is there but at the same time they are not simply reacting they kind of um, start or open kind of a new game because of this the way they declare this and how they they, they, they go about it so i think the, 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 there, there are things that uh, resonate with this and the way in which we try to think about yeah uh, also insurrection or whatever ways in which uh, something can be articulated that actually um yeah, moves us uh, perhaps uh, somewhere else or opens uh, a new uh, 
new point of departure or a new perspective or, or, or whatever. Uh, but yeah, otherwise it's also, I mean, uh, just one more thought relating to the question of tragedy and what is tragic. It's also like, if you look at this classical tragical heroes, uh, and heroines, particularly perhaps, uh, they are not very lovable, <laughs> not nice people that we would identify with. I mean, this is a very interesting procedure, which I think is uh, very much lacking, uh, lacking in um, uh, in our, let's say, in our times, because we want our heroes to be lovable, we want to identify with them, we want them to be lustrous in this uh, sense also, and it's not this, okay, there are some anti-heroes that appear, but, but this is not exactly the same as anti-hero, it's a kind of a split between this you cannot identify subjectively with this, but nevertheless, you learn something and you, you, you get to some truth, which is not um, by way of simply like uh, feelings and sentiments, identification and so on. And I think this is very powerful and very strong uh, because it lets us, uh, let us think about things in a very different way and perhaps more uh, more thoroughly. So perhaps one more, precisely this, um, not really ambiguity, but this um, impossibility to just uh, say, uh, okay, this is good or bad, but you feel that something is nevertheless happening here, which is uh, important. So this could be, and by the way, I have this example in, in the book, you know, of uh, Assange, uh, which I think it's an interesting way of, uh, he. The, the, it's so funny how in many ways he kind of mirrors Antigone. Uh, I mean, mirrors in the sense that, oh, he, he revealed some terrible state wrong that was committed in the name of the state and so on. And he was literally buried for life for it. I mean, buried alive. Uh, it's kind of uh, the same sentence as Antigone gets. She's not killed, she's burned uh, buried alive uh, and but at the same time she he's not exactly a hero again that there are there were all these other aspects of his character of his character flaws that were extremely important also in the way the public was kind of more or less led uh, to some extent at least to if not against him to kind of uh, okay but this guy is you know not only the sex scandals but also some character flaws were really important argument in the the kind of uh, character assassination that uh, went uh, on there and there again there is this kind of not really a tragic dimension but almost in the sense of even if he is not in this sense uh, i mean the, we cannot make this obfuscate or screen what he says and what is absolutely true and pertinent and uh, needed to be uh, exposed If this uh, yeah answers some <laughs> no this is this is interesting but i would propose to move a little bit to, to change the, the 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 topic a little bit uh the world today is in a kind of a strange uh turmoil uh there is another war going on uh on in europe and which at least for a certain period of time was uh, deemed impossible other wars are looming uh strange alliances in the east and in the balkans are uh, are are being uh, formed uh, there are possible attempts to westernize oppressive regimes for in, for instance uh, in iran among other uh, other places uh, what is your assessment of our uh, present uh, present predicament if we can speak of one i think i would answer by focusing on one of the things that you mentioned, because I really think, for instance, that for one, we don't talk about enough about Iran. I think it's really, and if you allow me, I, I think I would give you this opportunity to, because, okay, there are other things that uh, obviously also relate to Antigone, perhaps. I was just asked by some Iranians to actually comment on the book in relationship to also what is going on in the Iran and so on. I, I won't do this here, but I, what I think is that uh, particularly on the left, there is this, uh, that there, there would be really a much more need for a better discussion and involvement analysis of what is going on, because obviously nothing is decided yet. Um, 
everybody agrees. I mean, if you read people, I, I mean, I, I have a very good friend who is also um, uh, passing me some comment from within. I mean, there, there are lots of analysis that are being made and uh, everybody agrees that there is, this is a very different kind of revolution and movement also, even if it takes, I mean, there is a whole history, obviously, in Iran of this kind of movements, but it's not, it's, it's very different in many, many, many ways. Uh, and if we just describe this uh, in the way, and this is not meant against you, you were just enumerating the, 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 the kind of wording that this gets usually, uh, um, this attempt to kind of westernize this oppressive regime, I think we, if it's just by terming it in this way, we already kind of shut down or uh, really limit the, the set of options. You know, we get again this kind of story. They will will they simply move to the uh, liberal capitalist uh, West, and we know how bad this is, or they will just simply re remain whatever in this authoritarian uh, state. But as if it would be completely unconceivable that something would take place in Iran other than they're simply joining the club of Western liberalism. I'm not saying that it will happen, but it seems that we are already kind of um, precipitatingly thinking that, okay, this is the only thing that uh, that can happen. And I think we should not do this uh, move, for instance, and we should reconsider precisely this kind of uh, um, leftist veteran uh, reaction to, to, to this, uh, because I think it's not so original as it pretends to be. And also we should kind of carefully listen to the to all the analysis and self-reflection that is going on there. And one of the slogans that you know is precisely neither the king nor the leader. It's not that, that, that it's neither nor. I think it's a very important and interesting structure of what is going on. Not that there is, okay, what is the third way, but still uh, I think it opens up a space in a different way. And, um, and also, uh, Obviously, there is this whole, uh, what the Iranian officials are saying is this classical story. This is the, the Western propaganda that they are trying to undermine a different kind of regime from within. So this is all um, imposition of Western values. This has nothing to do with, you know, this human rights of uh, cultural agenda is actually their way of trying to eliminate our difference. But wait a minute, I, and I think here it's really important to, to say who did place all stakes on the cultural front? It's precisely the regime. I mean, the way they decided that the, the hijab would be the, 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 the main symbol of this, this is this does this really they, they did reinforce the, the, the struggle there and why? Uh, because I mean. If you just take this, I think it's quite clear that uh, the death of uh, Masha Amini was was the event, of course, that triggered and set on fire uh, the, the the Iranian social tissue, but which was already bursting with contradictions, antagonisms, uh, injustices, not only regarding women, but uh, also regarding, let's say, the, the social economic situation of the vast majority of people. Sanctions are, of course, an important factor factor here. But when we talk about uh, the, the sanctions and about the Iranian conflict with the US, uh, we should not forget, I think, one thing, namely that while Iranian government entered an ideological, let's say, cultural war with the West, the US, they embraced at the same time the Western neoliberal capitalist model without much reserve. Uh, opting for kind of, you know, this is what people, the mass privatization, economic deregulation, I mean, this is some concrete measures that were taken like uh, over decades. Um, so they were very much in line with the International Monetary Fund. You know, these things that tend to be forgotten. So cultural and religious stakes were thus almost the only significant difference with the despised Western other, you know, because they give, gave ground on, on uh, some considerably different economic and social policies. So this is, uh, I think, very important to keep in mind. So that, that this kind of similarity in economic politics has been 
it would be as devastating as the difference in religious politics or in this kind of symbolic uh, regulation. So, and I think precisely this combination of whatever theocracy and then this rentier capitalism, uh, which resulted in the everything that we see now disappearing not only on the middle class, the uh, majority of people employed only on short time contracts, it's problems with minorities, starting with the Kurdish uh, and so on. So. Uh, and in this sense, I think that the exclusion of women from the social and political space uh, was kind of a uh, uh, cultural difference increasingly started to function as a kind of uh, decoy, decoy used by the, the, the authorities themselves to distract from the economic similarity, sameness with the West. You know? They needed uh, this kind of, we are different and now they want to, to, uh, to crash us. Uh, it, it critically functions as the kind of, I would say, all of the, the hijab as a mask of the lack of the absence of economic, economically sustained political difference in Iran. So at least to the, the and this I think was all what was uh, in play. So the women were forced to embody for the whole state uh, the difference which no longer had any tangible bias, uh, bas basis, you know. And so the more this was, the society was kind of really disintegrating in the social sense, the more this, uh, severity, the repression or the emphasis placed on these symbols increased. So in, in, any, in any way, I think that um, this feminist struggle there is really kind of putting together or is a kind of point of capiton of all these different struggles. And this is also unprecedented. I mean, not only expressions of solidarity, but how different segments of society um, literally going on strike, doing something, not only protesting and saying uh, we support this. So there is something happening here. And uh, um, I think it, when they talk about freedom, we don't need to take this as they're just wanting to join uh, freedom as it exists uh, in the West or somewhere else. But uh, perhaps what is at stake is precisely redefining what freedom means. For also for us, not only for for themselves. So uh, I think we should really be kind of um, more uh, attentive, and I think um, focused on this what is going on because I think it is something important to going on, and it's not uh, uh, okay. There are all these other words that you mentioned, so I'm sorry. I just uh, but uh, I I think there is some moment here which is um, um, yeah important. Thanks so much. I can again. I think very, very, very well connect the, the 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 next question to it. I mean, if if the hijab, as you indicated, an enhancing cultural emblem becomes the mask of a lacking difference, and hence the symbol of a struggle yeah. for difference, if I understand correctly, then 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 do you think that artistic works offer somehow an approach to uh, such a political conjuncture? I mean, that, that could be um, one way of phrasing that question. I mean, um, I was particularly struck, I mean, um, when you said that you, you were asked to speak about Antigone in the context of, of um, the Iranian situation. There was once, right, I think the Freedom Theater did uh, Antigone in Yenin refugee camp, and there was something, right? Um, so do you think there, there is, there is some not only diagnostic maybe but also diagnostic a uh, diagnostic or even political power of artworks to approach political conjunctures yeah i think i mean and there could be something uh, also very um specific uh, to Antigone uh, in this sense, uh, because I, I i also read a very very interesting analysis it is by an anonymous person from from Iran, uh, I guess still living there. Uh, so I don't, I cannot quote her name or his because I don't know the name, but uh, it's accessible. I mean, you can uh, find it online. Um, and it's a very interesting analysis of how, okay, it's a long analysis, but of how, what emerged here now in Iran is this, um, this still, still photographers 
there, there is a move from videos, you know, videos of movements, of people demonstrating, of violence, of this, and how actually what we have here are just these iconic shots, like stills, you know, it just, and um, moreover, this frozen in time, it's not, you don't need to tell the story, you just have a figure. And this is another important uh, point in this analysis, you have not so much faces, I mean, we speak about faces and pull, pulling the jihad up, but actually what this person claims is that it's obvious, it's the opposite that is going on, that this, this is a, these are faceless figures, the, the way they pose on these trash bins, or something. it's something, it's a figure that becomes important, and the desire to be that figure, to put yourself in the position of this figure that kind of animates a lot of this uh, movement. So it's not even if it's about, it's not, uh, they are all also very often covered up because of the, you know, surveillance. So, that there, there, so there is, it's a very interesting thing, but it's a figure, of resistance, it is how it is called here, in a sense of just, you just stand there, do nothing, you don't need even to declare, just you find your pose and these still shots are then kind of, you know, uh, make a movement go on, you know? even though they're uh, very fixed in time and space. So I think, it, uh, I mean, this is just a very, very uh, crappy and uh, quick summing up of many other arguments, but I think there is something about it because I think Antigone also always strikes me as a figure. It's not simply, I mean, it's uh, uh, figuring a certain configuration and just in all the, in this kind of fixation, this kind of standstill that comes with a figure of insurrection or figure of emancipation, whatever, but it's a figure. Uh, and I guess this is what um, makes it um, a very, um, uh, uh, very prone to be uh, reactivated in this kind of circumstances that uh, that you uh, evoked. You know, that there, there is uh, this figure that can re-emerge in every specific context that that, uh, uh, that rhymes with it and uh, that embodies again uh, the blind spot of this structure, this kind of, uh, that, that is the, the, the capiton of this or that. So, and um, of course this, there is also a, in relationship to what we were uh, discussing earlier, why Antigone, why she here and now, uh, I also have this idea, this is that uh, if you look at these reemergences of of this figure of rewritings and so on, it seems that every time that there is some kind of a serious tectonic shift taking place or crisis or in the social fabric, she comes to life again. It's not simply, I mean, it's usually in, in times of certain, I mean, not turmoil, but also tectonic shifts where the the, the very texture of Zitlichkeit seems to be uh, changing, profoundly moving, and then this figure appears. And so uh, I guess this could also be yeah, one way of, uh, of, uh, of answering your, your question. So a figure, it's a kind of uh, interesting figure, <laughs> but um, which is different than face or the slogan. I mean, it's a configuration of it's obviously it's a body, but body that is precisely not just body in the sense of now we are back to the body, but body that embodies uh, a certain social structure uh, in a in a very interesting way. So I I, I guess this is also the power of uh, also yeah the Antigone and this is what accounts for this more this sublime whatever splendor as Lacan always, uh, which is also there in these iconic figures. The shots that we see some of them at least from this uh, what is happening now uh, in Iran. Or did you? Uh, I'm not sure if I answered. You, you had uh, okay. No, I think that was. Uh, can we move to fans? Uh, just recently, you wrote a piece on uh, "Don't Look Up." So yes. our question is. Uh, why is this movie interesting for understanding our uh, ideological climate, if the pun is allowed? Yeah, I mean, for many reasons, probably. But uh, uh, one, for me at least, that was really um, important also because of some things that I was working on recently, is that I think the movie does a great job of portraying our social climate 
as that of, I would put it like this, ordinary perversion, <laughs> not ordinary psychosis, ordinary perversion. And I have to say that I am borrowing this term from a student of mine, uh, Catherine Barina Phipps, who is using this in her dissertation or in some other, a little bit different emphasis. But uh, what I want to convey with this expression is that uh, the way we deal as a society, at least, okay, again, in the West, let's say, with uh, these uh, traumatic ex social experiences with crisis and stuff like this, uh, our prevailing response to, to this social traumatism is much more, much closer, closer to disavowal, to for, uh, what Freud called fetishist perverse disavowal than to repression in this classical sense of verdringung, you know. And uh, if I just quickly try to sketch out the difference between the two, um, like we can do it like with this kind of topological image, repression implies something uh, like two, two levels, you know, you have something and then the, something is repressed from this level and remains, let's say, on this other uh, level it is pushed out from our reality no longer constitutes part of this reality even though through symptoms and stuff it kind of makes its presence felt but nevertheless you have these two levels and this level on the other hand is kind of one dimension uh, in the sense that what is disavowed does not disappear from reality, it is still there, we know about it, we talk about it all the time, even uh, it's on the same surface part of our reality, everything is out on the open, uh, but still doesn't really affect us. So this evolved for me, um, it's interesting because it doesn't make something disappear, but changes or affects the character of this something. It's real or it's a reality. Uh, so uh, we could say, yeah, that it derealizes it, whatever affects the nature, the meaning of this something. The, 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 the thing doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean anymore. So um, perhaps we could also say that um, whereas in repression, the thing remains, the repressed things remains extraordinary precisely because it is pushed out and it's still kind of very mm, explosive in itself. But what happens here is that this extraordinary character of certain things just disappears and we take them as completely ordinary, although kind of rationally we can see that they are not, that they are actually, whatever, threatening, devastating. So, um, it, and I think it's, um, uh, so the, the repression preserves this extraordinary character, whereas this evolution keeps it as part of reality, but changes uh, its character. So, uh, and I think uh, this is for me why, for instance, or simply we could say that some game-changing fact an or becomes an ordinary fact. But in this, if you permit me, just make another um, connection here, uh, it, it still remains a fact, and this is important. Uh, what is disavowed is its game-changing dimension. For instance, that, uh, okay, be it climate uh, change, catastrophe, whatever, war, uh, it is not pushed out of the reality. It, what is changed is its game-changing dimension. We say it is the game changer, but we still continue to behave as if it were not, you know, according to this classical disavowal formula, I know very well, but I go on um, behaving as if uh, this I, I didn't know it. But this about facts and how the it remains a fact, but it's not uh, something is lost about it. Perhaps this is what we like to refer today as this post-factual world. Uh, not that there are no more facts, but that there are perhaps only facts. You know, there are facts, but there is no way of, uh, they all have the same, that is none, almost emotional charge or charge of the real. Uh, there, there are too many facts actually in this, but it's no, so, and I think that uh, this is one of the kind of uh, general things that I really liked about uh, uh, WhatsApp, the way they proceed in the movie, how they confront us with precisely death, no, not a moral outrage, not, but this kind of ultimately grotesque uh, 
caricature of reality, but which is actually less a caricature of reality because reality is caricature of itself already in the way in this way uh, of its functioning, okay? But there are many other things that I uh, really like in the movie, beginning with how it does, don't, doesn't does try to just play, uh, let's say, uh, American Republicans against Democrats. I mean, this kind of, it doesn't make this easy step of presenting this ridiculous, stupid uh, uh, politics as just the politics of uh, Donald Trump and uh, the, the, his whatever, fellow travelers, but uh, as something that is very much part of the liberal mainstream, which is also predicated upon this function, this disavowal, and the, the way they like to talk about this and the emphasis, ah, oh, this is a serious problem, it's a problem, is part of this game. It's not, it's part of not seeing what is going on. And I think, again, this is what um, I, I liked in the movie. I think. Is there is there something you? I mean, uh, if there are other other works, contemporary of uh, contemporary works that do that, um, please tell us about them. I mean, that 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 allow us to see something about the constitutional structure of reality itself, if I understand correctly. I mean, that was the move move that you that you uh, just made. I mean, is there something for you that particularly theater and film can do? Maybe because they're dramatic and. Or maybe 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 that is just not the case. Um, like, does theater and film have the power to 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 that allows us to understand something about our 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 the constitution of our social reality? Um, and maybe music or something else does not. I mean, is it media specific? If I um, am allowed to sound uh, as if I'm as German? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh... Yeah, I don't know. First, I, I, I think perhaps uh, what what is good in if, we, if I start at the beginning of your question, uh, if there are other works, I mean, there are other works of art or whatever movies that do this, but they are, yeah, rare or good works, or, or usually are. Uh, in, and what is really interesting here is precisely that it doesn't take this kind of, uh, and this was, uh, actually an objection made to this movie. Uh, it, it doesn't want to uh, kind of illuminate us and um, um, there is no um, moralistic outrage, oh listen, you know, it's, uh, I really like this way in which the movie uh, imitates this. It's as if we're not nothing. It's not, oh, this is the big, big issue. We now need to uh, mobilize people for the cause. Uh, no, I think the, the way it succeeds to pointing this out and perhaps even mobilizing because it's by precisely not going in this sense directly. So, and I, I think usually this works much better in terms of whatever, movies, culture, art, than, uh, than this kind of direct activism, which uh, misses something, it's uh, very often at least. Uh, so as to the second part of your question, movies, of course, because of their, Sure, I mean, this is a part of the technology built into them and the fact that they can be so widely distributed there. Uh, they, they also have this cultural power because they can reach millions of people um, almost at the same time. So it's something that it's not the case for uh, several other forms of art, even books and poetry, they, they can be translated, of course, but it's not. Another thing which is interesting about uh, movies and uh, and theaters is that they, uh, they are kind of collective experiences. Okay, movies perhaps now less or so because of the, we, we are more and more staying at home watching them, whatever, on Netflix and so on. Uh, but the, 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 the sheer fact of, kind of finding yourself in this dark <laughs> uh, theater uh, with people that most of them you see for the first time, nevertheless, thinking something together and experiencing this certain kind of reaction, uh, whatever, to this, it is a kind of collective form experience. And I think this is interesting because you mentioned music and the big difference with music, but in this respect, it's similar. In music, you have concerts, you have this kind of possibly collective um, 
even though silently, I mean, it doesn't go through images and uh, stuff, but it's uh, uh, it also could be music, could be collective forming. And I think perhaps it's not so, um, um, it's not a, by coincidence that you have, uh, again, this is the example of Iran now, that you have these songs that sometimes become the, the vehicle also of the, not only the slogans, but the, the something that you, you sing the song and you are part of a collective uh, that thinks something in a certain way, or the, so it's a kind of a whatever, not, not could be also expression of solidarity or whatever, but so, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, but I guess, um, perhaps this is also part, it depends on whether you talk of these cultural productions and stuff. If you take culture in uh, this kind of broader sense, in which, for instance, Freud talks about uh, um, unbehangen in der Kultur, the, the word is there, the Kultur, where the culture basically means the social social relations uh, regulation of these relations but the, it's more or less synonymous with social with our being social beings and uh, forced to live together in one way or another uh, and of course everything that can everything that belongs to this um, and the cultural production is also part it has always been and religious production and so on part of the how this social tissue is being formulated reflected upon and so on but it's also true that what we call art sometimes is more specific the, the referring to some kind of more extraordinary events or uh, innovations or creations which are uh, then of course become usually part of the culture but they are they are not they don't have necessarily this kind of immediate um, power to to reflect or mobilize a certain um, a public sentiment but uh, so i don't know it's uh, um, they, they they operate in different ways this is for sure Uh, well, how would you describe, or rather, qualify the role the role of novels for your uh, for your thinking or for your uh, philosophical uh, project, or maybe uh, what do you think of novels as a form uh, of conceptual, artistic, or philosophical uh, expression? <laughs> Yeah, it's a tough question. I don't know. I, I I really like novels. I like reading novels, also some more trashy novels, not necessarily the. the but but so it's. Uh, but I I'm not sure. I mean, obviously I have uh, used let's say it, um, examples or things that I um, from from different novels in in my work and so on. Uh, but um, I don't think novels are primarily uh, conceptual forms of expression. They, they are, again, at, at least, again, for me, and I'm not here even a kind of theoretician of, uh, um, of novels or anything like this, but there is, uh, for me, what is really, uh, what works in novels is precisely, again, there are these configurations uh, uh, which are, part of the story, or but sometimes we talk about story, but there they, they are these configurations that are brought to light uh, of characters, relations, uh, desires, subjectivities that are um, quite unique. And I think they are precisely for, for being fictitious, they are not at all less real than something that we uh, that we uh, experience, let's say, in, in our everyday life. But there is, of course, and I think Deleuze has, uh, has a line on this. Uh, there are these kind of characters from novels, okay, also from plays that start to function as proper names of certain conceptual constellations. Like, and this is obviously clear for Antigone, Hamlet, Oedipus, and many others, Don Juan, whatever, Bovary, uh, or Doppelganger, in sense. So uh, there are these um, some proper names that kind of do evoke for us or very uh, efficiently name certain conceptual configurations which then uh, are uh, yeah you don't need to uh, to write the whole dissertation you just test yeah like Antigone or whatever Oedipus uh, so um, there but I guess this is already part of the 
or the interaction of these novels, of these works of art with the way we read them, think about them, and further, yeah, conceptualize or find resonances with different uh, things. So, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I was, the, the way I kind of refer to some novels from time to time, it's more because I, I really think that, uh, as I said before, in all the uh, fictitious, uh, I mean, if they're characters, works of fiction, they have this power to actually um, confront you or to, to, to make you grasp a certain real of a uh, certain relationship, perhaps much better than just a kind of a directly realistic uh, uh, example taken from life, so to say, uh, would have. Because there has been already a thought uh, that uh, was at work in this. And this thought is real. And it's not simply uh, something to be dismissed because uh, so it, I guess it's for me, it's very important to, to yeah, to read this stuff. Um can, can we can we maybe briefly return again to, um, into uh, political waters? I mean, um, and and I think it sort of connects to your um, very illuminating remarks about the distinction between repression and and disavowal, because already Lenin, that's that's in state and revolution, I think, um, warns or identifies diagnosis a kind of domestication of Marx. Uh, he basically says, um, I mean, Marx becomes Saint Marx, right? Everyone is a Marxist, he says. Yeah, um, yeah. Right? Um, um, but somehow a Marxist of a specific kind, right? Um, so a Marxist that doesn't cost you much, uh, so to speak, right? You, uh, I mean, you can align yourself under the name. Yeah, yeah. Get all, get all that, that, that's comfortable uh, without getting all the stuff that makes it difficult. Um, do you see any any anything like that going on, let's say, on the whatever that is left um, uh, today? Do you think something something similar is going on? Absolutely, I, I do think so. I think that, okay, we probably all agree that uh, there is a lot uh, wrong on the right now, so, uh, but on or so-called left or whatever. Uh, but uh, I think precisely, and this is really relates to what uh, you just mentioned, this uh, connection to the disavowal and this kind of domestication via um, flagging something, uh, some knowledge which then makes all the rest uh, rather irrelevant or not really uh, pertinent. What I see, uh, uh, what strikes me very often in some of the debates, at least on the left, is this kind of uh, uh, primacy or the importance attributed to, uh, like, let's say, sanctioning ourselves as leftists or declaring ourselves or proving that we really are leftists, that we really are Marxist, and as if this was more important than anything else. The the, the way that we were that we are properly perceived, not mistaken. For the, so and then this basically means accepting this kind of a, almost a game of what words to use, what exactly declare, what sides to take, which are sometimes ridiculous because they are so automatic in the sense of, you know, what, uh, uh, but I think it's really, I mean, to go a little bit to the extreme, one could say that um, uh, we are simply satisfied with accomplishing uh, that we are recognized as the leftist in the in the right camp. So uh, uh, we assert this in public debates or whatever social media, and we are satisfied that we complied with the, this kind of image or ego ideal or whatever um, uh, of the left. And I think it's the job done. It's a little bit like in this this world, you know, we know well. Uh, here it we do well we, we we are on the right side of the but even if it's completely non consequential so and i think uh, this is one thing and the other is um, perhaps only in some segment of what is called rightly or unrightly called the left is this kind of a almost super egoic dimension uh, when uh, it's sometimes hard to uh, keep up with these updates in the left jargon of authenticity, so to say, because this keeps changing in it, and the stakes become more and more the higher and higher. And even if yesterday you were still considered a nice leftist, you can be <laughs> deemed 
or thrown out of this uh, whatever uh, group the, the the next day because so and this becomes a kind of somebody i think had already this diagnosis that the, the left is kind of devouring itself in this uh in this movement it's uh so but there is a very yeah problematic thing that is going on i think uh that would need to be kind of interrupted but of course uh, so this also auto criticisms of the left are uh, true and necessary, whatever. But of course, they are they are not enough. I mean, we can know what is wrong, uh, but I don't think that it is by describing what a true leftist looks like or what a true leftist movement look like that we will make it appear. <laughs> this is not how it will happen. So uh, I guess perhaps we are too much engaged in this. Uh, um, yeah self-reflective uh, modality as well i'm not saying that this is not necessary but it's uh, just if it's not enough if it stops there and we uh, but, but uh, also because you know movements tend to be very messy this is not something usually that where you have a very clear cut positions or uh, it's very often also that the, you know not not all movements are emancipatory obviously but also um, they are composed of many different of many different things some of which are really worth fighting for and some perhaps will fall out or whatever but uh, i guess the certain kind of um, as i said earlier not uh, judging too quickly perhaps or uh, letting a certain logic be played out or intervening in this or trying to it, it's also important and uh, more, much more so because things are going on now than just this kind of uh, uh, declarations that okay we could see this also in the case of the ukraine war where well, they, they were immediately to camps and uh, it was i don't know it's too, too quick. I mean, I was really what? How how do people know so clearly and exactly? Because they just follow some other patterns that they're used to and that they feel safe about. But uh, this way, nothing will change in time if you are not ready to kind of perhaps reconsider some of these um, rails on which you drive as a leftist or a rightist or whatever for for a while. So uh, I guess we should really literally snap out of this uh, um, yeah, tendency to kind of uh, um, redefine things before it is even time to, to do this and to, to think them through as they are happening a little bit more engaged in the, in the context in which they are happening. To, to follow up, uh, to follow up on this, uh, do you think there is a contemporary relevance of uh, Marx at all, or uh, differently put, do you think Marx can offer any potential whatsoever for revitalizing or repoliticizing the meaningless signifier that is called the left? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as you say, and as uh, Frank said before, it's very often that it's just this kind of a label, you know, Marx or Che Guevara, you have, you have this kind of iconic, and then you, the, so I get, I would uh, answer like this. Uh, of course, I strongly believe there is relevance, so that Marx is still relevant. And I strongly believe that, uh, uh, for instance, not for instance, but per perhaps primarily, uh, class struggle theory is as pertinent as ever. But the crucial question is precisely what you do with it. It is not enough to just like recognize it every time and say, okay, but this is, forget it, this is just class struggle or to just use the signifier class struggle every time you get the chance to do this and then you, your work is done because you prove that you are a right Marxist. Uh, I, I don't think this is how uh, actually we stay true to Marx in a way uh, by the, the, this kind of uh, uh, flashy signifiers. I think Marx did understand Tend and analyze the, the functioning of, let's say, capitalism and its political economy probably better than anyone, at least obviously up to, uh, to, to, to him. Um, it's also true that capitalism is changing, has changed since, and is undergoing, uh, I think, rather spectacular change as we speak. But this does not mean that Marx's analysis are no, no longer pertinent or, or useful. Uh, but 
uh, it means that we have to kind of uh, think deeper also and with the help of Marx, but not, not just stop at this kind of uh, uh, obvious science that we recognize, we, we need to learn to recognize uh, different science and also different sides of this antagonism. Uh, because, uh, you know, you have this iconic picture of the factory as the site of the whatever class struggle. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the factory as it still functioned uh, some time ago, you know, if you take uh, the Chaplin, Chaplin's movie, The Modern Times, you know, you have these iconic images of factories as the site precisely of, uh, uh, let's say, the, 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 the way in which pro production is organized, that uh, that were also the, the, the really, let's say, incarnations of the blind spot of the of the structure of capitalist production. So I'm no, no longer sure if we can simply uh, remain, not that the factories are no longer there, but I'm not sure that they play the same kind of, uh, that they have occupied the same kind of position in the capitalist <clears throat> mode of production uh, uh, right now. So uh, it is, uh, again, and as we were talking about uh, it sooner, uh, what is happening, in Iran, with this uh, hijab or hijab or simply feminist struggle as kind of leading the the the, the resurrection, the revolution, this does not mean that this is okay. Narrowing it down, that this should be taken together precisely, and how it can actually uh, represent also the class struggle. Right? It's not simply something. Uh, I think sometimes we also think uh, it could be precisely the point where the structure. Uh, the antagonism, the capitalist antagonism of this particular society can be grabbed more effi most efficiently and tackled with. It's not, uh, and it's also not that we have the same kind of point in all the societies, uh, but it's a kind of real effort to, 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 to recognize these points and to see that some of these points really can uh, uh, have this kind of an open line with the antagonisms behind them, and some do not. There's just, some are just whatever, uh, uh, but, but some they still have the, the power to tackle and to kind of contaminate other things and other areas of the social with this kind of idea, yeah, that this is uh, wrong or so. So I don't know, I think it's kind of really the, the only kind of, uh, whatever, not really advice, but slogan that we can get out of these different uh, movements is simply organize, organize, organize. Don't think too much about, okay, but this is perhaps uh, not the, our struggle, this is, it's, it's, a, it's our struggle. And if it's not, it will, turn out to be so later, but it's uh, somehow important to, yeah, organize, I would say. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that, that's a very, 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 very nice um, twist on the, on Lenin's work, 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 right, to organize, organize, organize. <laughs> um, can, we, can, can I ask um, uh, a absolutely maximal uh, question, because it's a methodological one somehow, but, but one that relates and resonates to I think with the things we talked about earlier, I mean, you are one of the best known and most creative and um, most systematic, well, psychoanalytic Lacanian philosophers. Um, what, what do you think these signifiers, and we mean like psychoanalysis and Lacanian or Lacan, what, what do they mean in the present conjunction? What do they mean for you? What do they stand for? Um, if, if we may say so. Yeah, I, I, I think I would only answer the second part of the question, what they mean for me. I mean, I, in general, I don't know there, but, but I, I guess it's, uh, for me, uh, psychoanalysis uh, still means a certain uh, revolution in thinking, simply. It's, uh, it happened, uh, and not only revolution in thinking about ourselves, okay, we have these things that we are not aware of, in our, in, in how as social beings we function and how, uh, how truth and knowledge, for instance, are not the same thing. I mean, all these problems that we were talking about uh, all through this uh, conversation can be related um, to, 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 to psychoanalysis and the thinking in the way in which it re revolutionized the, the, the thinking about, um, yeah, about things and ourselves as 
part of these things. And uh, I guess that uh, if there are any such things as a revolutionary concept, I think the unconscious is one of them. But precisely the struggle for it is ongoing. It's not that, okay, Freud said unconscious, so we uh, use it or not. The, the What is interesting in psychoanalysis and in all through the history of this movement, also we call it uh, psychoanalytic movement, uh, is precisely that it's not uh, that it cannot be taken for granted. The struggle for what exactly does the unconscious mean? What we um, how how we use it, how we analyze it, what, what we uh, do with it uh, has always been open to many, many different, uh, not only readings, but also revisions uh, coming and also to, to what I think uh, probably Lacan would call kind of social orthopedics, you know, it's so, it's an, uh, it's a concept which is clearly there in Freud, but the struggle for the uh, meaning of which is still ongoing. And it is, uh, and it always kind of probably demands this move that Lacan made, which is at the same time returning to Freud, but in order to go somewhere else and go somewhere else to not simply to repeat, to say, okay, let's return, let's see, but he to, to take Freud literally, but then also take him to, to not, not, not somewhere else, but in the sense of precisely um, addressing some of the things that uh, our present social, whatever political and so on um, reality is articulating so uh, so to, to keep uh, in this kind of synchrony with things that uh, are changing so it's not simply like uh, uh, repeating one and the same doxa but uh, really staying yeah I mean this is a banality but staying through to Freud through precisely rethinking uh, these things and seeing how they still can work in our present society, which has changed a lot since uh, uh, since Freud uh, wrote these things. So it's, uh, uh, but in, yeah, this is at least what these two uh, words or whatever uh, mean for me. It's a kind of thing that orientates me and reorientates me uh, when I, even when I feel at loss, at some bit uh, confronted with some things that are going on, and it's not very difficult to feel at loss uh, these days, I guess. Uh, I, I like uh, psychoanalysis as a permanent reorientation camp, one could say. Um, but, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but it helped. Yeah, but it's also some anchor point. It's not simply okay. It's both. It it allows you to to have some kind of orientation point, but also to to have this. If I use this word, uh, uh, freedom or um, risk to 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 rethink it in yeah some other ways perhaps. Alenka, uh, can we end this wonderful conversation with a series of either or questions? <laughs> we can I mean, you can, this. you can, <laughs> uh, you can elaborate on your choice, but clearly you don't have to. Okay, so can I begin? So it's either or, Reinstein or Leibach? Yes, please, I will use this um, thing that I, <laughs> I would say, yes, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, the second one, Hitchcock or Lubitsch? Yes, please. <laughs> Kafka or Beckett? Yes, please. <laughs> Antigone or Creon? Here I would say Antigone because of the reasons of asymmetry that I was uh, talking about before, but otherwise, I mean, the, what I'm repeating here, yes, please, it really refers to this, that I want to refuse certain choices that I don't yeah. think are very productive, even if one gets the night to put to <laughs> one's throat. <laughs> then the next one is comedy or tragedy? Again, yes, please. <laughs> please. And two more to go, Freud or Lacan? Yes, please. <laughs> And the very last one, psychoanalysis or philosophy. I think I already used this phrase once in this yeah. context. Precisely, yes, please. Yeah. I, I yeah. haven't changed my mind. So, <laughs> uh, 
This okay, is uh, fantastic. So... Uh, you, you you pleaded the philosophical fifth, one could say, right? <laughs> this is what they did. <laughs> um, um, and rightly so. Um, thank you so much, Alenka. Alenka, thank you so much for this. Uh, thank you. I mean, this was a great conversation. I, I really liked it. So. Well, wonderful. Okay. Um, yeah. See, see you soon. Somewhere, see you yeah. soon again. Yeah. <laughs> see you soon. Bye. <laughs>